Good morning and welcome to the place where I spend so much of my time and waste so much of my time uh, looking at the landscape and writing and, uh, and having my imagination stimulated by this fantastic environment that we live in. I'm wanting to invite you to come along on the Saturday the 16th of October. Um, the, we're having the launch of my latest book, which is a collection of short stories called The Upper Thong Thunderbolt. Um, and it's happening at 4pm on Saturday the 16th at the Memorial Hall in Bigbury. The cover, incidentally, was not written, designed by me. It was designed by someone called John Cooper. Um, and, but it does capture what the first story is actually about, which is a naive young vicar who gets his first mission in a Yorkshire village. And he decides, foolishly really, to go and play snooker with the locals at the house of a lady called Widow Wendy. Um, just let me revert to my Yorkshire accent just for a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, sounds a bit camp, doesn't it? Anyway, he plays, he, has, he plays snooker, but he, he, but he doesn't know that he has something that Widow Wendy wants. And Widow Wendy always, always gets what she wants. So, that's one of the stories in here. Um, and, uh, but do come along and join us. The, uh, the proceeds from the event will go towards the Tower and Bells Fund, and, uh, which I think is something that we owe it to all those generations of people who lived in the village and used the church and prayed there and died there and married there uh, and we had christenings there. Those generations of people who trod those lanes and we ought to restore that building for them. So I do hope you'll join us. It'll be a, it'll be a fun event and uh, you won't be disappointed if you come along to that. So that's 4 p.m. Saturday the 16th of October at the Memorial Hall in Bigbury. Now as a little tempter, I've got a new short story to read to you, which I will read now. It's called The Transformation of Rupert Sweet. Now, Louise very kindly published it in the Bigbury News. And it's a story that's about someone who is forgotten in the writing industry, a story about someone who has to edit books, which must be the most tedious thing in the world. A bit like, if, you're, if there are any teachers out there, you know what it's like when you receive a pile of ropey sixth form essays, you know you've got a, you've got a mark, you know, and edit. Um, he works for uh, a, a writer of chiclet novels, um, and she has just sent him the latest manuscript, uh, and this is the 14th manuscript that he's received from this author who goes by the name of Amanda Tempest. Her real name is Lavinia Stoat. You get, you get the picture. So the story starts with him reading one of the lines from her book, which he finds utterly, utterly appalling. So here we go. The transformation of Rupert Sweet. Snow blanketed the landscape. It muffled the sound and hid the roads. Rupert Sweet stared bleakly at the sentence. Same old crap. Of course, the sodding snow muffled sound and hid the sodding roads. What else would its sodding well do? Always the same. Amanda Tempest, also known as Lavinia Stote, always started her nausenly sanctimonious so-called novels with the same kind of opening sentence. If it wasn't snow, it would be a row of benighted willow trees tossing their branches balefully at the moon or scudding clouds sliding across the sky and revealing the stars shining on the chic outline of Stote's latest 20-something heroine, for whom love was always a perilous trek through the bleak tundra of Lavinia's completely empty intellect. Rupert was not sure how much more of this he could take. This was the 14th novel by Lavinia Stote that he was expected to edit. Not that the permanently sozzled chiclet diva of Ilfracombe ever showed any appreciation of his work. Indeed, Rupert was convinced that once he had submitted his edits, the manuscript was swiftly conveyed to the publishers for them to sort out the trivial business of typesetting, marketing, and inducing other desperate authors to provide ridiculously flattering reviews. And desperation was the sheer sickness of the publishing industry. People wanting to be someone, to be noticed, flattered, even loved by readers they would never meet, 
from countries they would never go to. Or they would appear at literary festivals and be the subject of a gushing introduction before reading their deathless prose or poetry to ranks of people perched on uncomfortable plastic chairs who were really wondering whether Tesco's would still be open. Had Stote ever read the edited versions of her novels? After her books were, were launched, she would appear on one of those late night chat shows, swathed in a feather boa and crimson fedora, and as far as Rube could tell, as pissed as a fart. Or one of those morning cultural programmes on Radio 4, when Amanda, call me Mandy, would, de- would talk in deep tones about her mission to get her readers to release their inner weasel. But Rupert knew the truth of it. Lavinia was simply an addict of her own ideas and could not contemplate anything else. Without the stream, she would be lost and knew it. Rupert read on. Symphony Probert, the latest heroine, was lighting a gulwaz and puffing a smoke plume in the direction of the soon-to-be-rejected Roger. You mean... You mean, you're going to throw me over to spend your life with a small town bank manager at an Austin 7? How could you? Rupert reflected that Roger was well out of it, and the bank manager was heading for a good fleecing. I'm sorry, Roger. I just can't bear a man who cannot drive. It is something that I would expect a man who was remotely capable and potent to be able to do. Don't you agree? And Roger clad in a white alpine jacket and ski pants had promptly sunk to his knees and wept. Rupert smiled. Rupert glanced across his study, its desk cluttered, computer screens covered in dust and the bin overflowing. There was a gilt-framed mirror above his desk, a present from his mother. Rupert wondered if she had only given it to him in the hope that he would really begin to see how utterly ineffectual he really was. Every time he saw his image, it quietly enraged him. The face was benign between a thinning mat of hair. Rupert had encouraged one curl to loop coyly across his brow. But his face always seemed to evince a sense of surprise at his own image. In fact, a sense of surprise at everything. The people he met, and Rupert himself, lived in a permanent state of uncertainty that undermined his sense of resolve. Those cheekbones would never be heroic, the chin never jutting and assertive, the lips too thin to be passionate, the eyes too hesitant and darting to ever command the stage. No, Rupert had a sense that unless he did something to break the spell of his own confinement, he would always be enthralled to those in the grip of their own urgent fantasies. He looked back at the opening line once again. He knew that Stoke would want him to travel to her tedious, feline-filled seaside bungalow for another another dictation session. Lavinia would still be in bed, propped up by a bolster and cushions, attired in a silk dressing gown and jewelled beanie, her makeup misapplied to startling effect. Rupert would weave his way through a labyrinth of dangling paper butterflies before perching on a creaking Ikea chair, then, laptop on on knees, His fingers would dance at amazing speed to keep up with Lavinia's stream of literary effluent. Rupert's gaze moved to the bookshelf above his desk and his own modest works, Rupert's rural rambles, Gorgeous Gorge, The Joys of Cheddar, Garlic and the Human Condition, Britain's Greatest Garden Railways, These were not grandiloquent epics in the canon of Dostoevsky or Pasternak, but Rupert was convinced that there was more human understanding and empathy in just one of these books than any of Lutz Lavinia Stoat's sordid forays into the swamp of middle-class angst. Well, if Roger was to be rejected by symphony and Stoat did not even bother to read his edits, perhaps the time had come. Rupert had had an idea, a devilish one. He drew his chair up to his desk, feeling a fresh energy. 
If snow was to blanket the sodding landscape, perhaps it was time Rupert went a little off piste. Hmm, suppose Symphony was tragically run over by an errant snowplow driven by a jilted Roger at the end of chapter one. Oh, a truly finished symphony. Satisfying. Roger could then go on the run. A plot at last. Rupert began to sense the snow melt on the road to freedom. He started to type. Hope you enjoyed that. Looking forward to seeing you on the 16th of October, four o'clock, Memorial Hall, tea, wine, fun. Look forward to it. Thank you.